Okay, we're recording. Um, welcome, everybody. This is the um, bi weekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab, the first meeting of the spring term. We will be hosting talks here uh, every other Friday in this room, 12 to 1. And you can look at the CDL website for a schedule of upcoming talks. Um, we still have about four open slots. So if anybody would like to speak or would like to recommend a speaker, I'm all ears. Um, February 15th is the deadline for submitting applications for the SFS or CYSP scholarships. There's more information on the Cybersecurity Center webpage, and you can apply via scholarship receiver, retriever. Um, today, it's our honor to have a guest speaker, um, Filippo Chavareski from DePaul University, and he's going to be speaking on misinformation. All right, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I had to uh, restart my uh, meeting, but I'm back. So um, let me start sharing my slides. Can you all see the slides? Yes. Good. Okay. All right. Hi. Thank you once again. Thank you for inviting me. This is fresh new uh, out of the oven just submitted to Usenix security a um, couple of days ago. So it's um, we are really happy to show the work that we do at the adversarial cybersecurity automation lab, which I lead at the poll, um, and we do um, mostly work on misinformation, but we also do work on um, machine learning, adversarial machine learning, and um, social engineering. You can check our website, you can check our Twitter. Of course, we try to uh, keep uh, stuff uh, new and fresh, and everything that is published and comes out of the lab is there. Um, the topic of today's talk comes um, uh, as a line of research that we've done for, uh, for some time, uh, going back to, uh, to uh, points in history uh, where actually social media platforms realized that they have um, trouble on their hands and that they have to take some action instead of taking the back seat, uh, seeing that any information that comes on those platforms is not necessarily made uh, equal. So, uh, what, uh, uh, I will start with background. Uh, I mentioned this uh, approach by the by the platforms, and what the platforms did in the in the past, they started uh, tagging information. Okay, so um, I'll show you in the in the later slides later on. Uh, but uh, they um, thought they 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 probably were cornered a little bit uh, by being called to to the hill to talk why they don't do anything. So they took a little bit of um, a rather parsimonious approach into managing uh, misinformation, but events in history, of course, created a precedent for them to ban accounts, to remove accounts, to clean and tag uh, stuff that they believe um, is not according to their policies, which change frequently what it means, what information is and how information is deemed to be uh, faithful to known facts. I, um, and I'm saying that with emphasis in uh, in my enunciation because we created a platform called uh, Vox Pop. It's a platform that actually creates is in an experimental stage and actually allows for um, people to calibrate what information uh, is, what truth is, or not. And we presented that at NSPW as a new security paradigms workshop, and we received a avalanche of comments and debates on how truth is defined and what is incorporated in information, which we're really happy to, to incite such uh, interesting things. So we settled down on definition uh, and discrimination between different types of information and content, um, where one information is truthful to known facts, which can change, obviously, and information is uh, faithful to known facts, and information is unfaithful when people who craft an information and know the fact that this exists create something that is unfit. So with that uh, distribution of information online, obviously, uh, with uh, 
possibility for someone to be able to post anything or amplify with social bot and uh, put things that are not necessarily checked, that it created a problem for um, for uh, platforms and for users to be able to discern, right? When you go on Twitter or you go to your Facebook, you're not necessarily sitting next to you with an encyclopedia or you have two other computers open just to check facts every time, right? You want to scroll, you want to enjoy, you want to see memes, you want to see out of context things that it's laughable, that, that it's um, laughable, and that's that's perfectly fine. That's how it should that it should be. So, bottom line, uh, what uh, platforms, mainstream platforms? Speaking about mainstream platforms, I'm not speaking about alt platforms because alt platforms don't do uh, warnings or what it's called soft moderation. They not necessarily moderate things. I would say they don't entirely because we've done work and we're still doing work with getter and parlor and all platforms like gab so they don't do anything any moderation so when i see platforms i mean mainstream platforms facebook reddit twitter uh instagram and all that so what they opted to do they opted to do and to give some cues and some nudges and some advice that information is um that information is not necessarily people to know facts and let me fast forward and this is what they did, right? They did, they opted out for a couple of things. They opted out for either covers, as you see on the top, uh, where they cover the content, or they opted out for tags, okay? Uh, where they didn't cover the content, but uh, they um, added uh, some, uh, some iconography that it's mostly intended to create friction so people can stop and created some kind of language here to uh to looks like um, they are actually doing some kind of uh moderation okay so if you this is obviously informed from decades of work in uh usable security and i do my, my work most in usable security and usable security is when, when people say usable security could mean many things, and that's why I uh, uh, put five points here, five basic things when you think of usable security. The first thing historically started to be those padlocks that suggest that a connection is or is not HTTPS. Another thing that it's a good, very, very good, very um, effective advancement of usable security are Face IDs, graphic passwords, tokens. So those things were created to be usable by us, not necessarily for us to understand what's the magic behind it, but to be able to remain acceptable level for security. The same deal with password managers, right? We reused passwords and then Keychain came and then LastPass came and they randomized the passwords and they notify you when you have a duplicate passwords and now they're asking for money a little bit because they are um, if you want to have a pro account but nonetheless they generate randomized passwords something that was recommended but never done by users because our brains are not that big to generate and remember um, such long sequences um, i mean bar, bar uh, people who actually can uh, can do those uh, those things and obviously systems if you see in the past if you remember in the past um, Operating systems required for you to install anything. Now, operating systems give you an option for you to try in an hour, to try tonight, to try tomorrow. So, anything it's driven towards adopting a schedule or behavior or natural ergonomic uh, movement without compromising compromising security. And the last thing that I put it here is that uh, browsers like Chrome, like uh, Safari, uh, uh, Firefox. Etc. Opera, they created those uh, splash screens. In the beginning, these splash screens, when you visited a phishing website, right, were white and this was red. So the, the colors were inverted. Okay. So usable security also works towards um, creating frictions. That's how they're called design frictions or nudges or affordances that will interrupt a mindless or interrupt a very much um, uninvolved use of internet. Okay. So that's why they. Usually, browser backgrounds are white, and then that's why they created this kind of uh, changing color, created a contrast. When you see a contrast, when you see a red light, people are conditioned, when they see red lights, to think that something is right, that, that they have to stop or pay, pay attention. Stop signs, red lights, stuff like that. Of course, green, if, if we talk about color blindness and, and all that incorporated. 
And it's not just about the contrast, the usable security also evolved over time to be much more um, uh, suited to the, the to people's everyday uh, every, everyday life by by the uh, by using, as I said, see here a stop sign, and they created a little bit of obstacles. Again, we call them frictions, where you actually are given choices, right? You don't you haven't given you haven't been given multiple choices, but you've been given a couple of choices. Either you want to learn more, which not many people do, or you really, if you're in doubt, you really want to be safe. So they anchor you, which is another type of uh, human cognition or heuristics. They anchor you to go to something that you know. Details, you may encounter something that you don't know, but in the safety, you certainly something that you will subjectively assess. And when you have, when you're faced with such a choice, everyone wants to go to safety, right? If you don't know, then uh, better be safe than sorry. So advanced has been made to those things. Yes, people click. Yes, people ignore these things, and that's a normal thing. We are our cognitive load during the day, a, a very very big, and sometimes the goal that we have to achieve has to override the stuff that we have to do. To do. But what I'm putting this, I'm giving you context that usable security over the years and decades has created a good mediation between users, normal users, average users, uh, and systems that could cause security problems. So if someone with the, the over the years, the, the cost of participating through usable security is very low, right? It, it's created in, in such a way, these nudges and these frictions are created in such a way that um, do in fact um, uh, increase secure behavior online. So with the question is, if there is so much uh, advancement, if there is so many, uh, recommendations that one could use, why social media platforms are not doing these kind of things, okay? And of course, you can always interrupt me if you if you have a ready answer, I'm happy to hear, okay? Uh, I don't receive any money from any social platforms, so I'm fine in commenting and anything, and even if I do, um, truth should not be suppressed. So there is a, the question where we come in, right, um, is, why all of this has not been used on social media, even though social media has seen, as I said, um, events that have tectonic shifts, created tectonic shifts in how information is consumed and deemed truthful and faithful to known facts. Okay. So on one one of the reasons, okay, one of the reasons, the genesis of the uh, of, of the problem that we explored is one of the reasons is of course usability. Right, usability and security are not necessarily things that go hand in hand. Um, and social media wants for you to scroll endlessly. <laughs> it's less links, more accounts, more memes, more jokes, more uh, gossip uh, stuff like that. So it needs content. Okay, it needs content so uh, it can add advertisements. Obviously, it can monetize those things. Fair enough. All of these companies. Um, are private enterprises, and it uh, nudges people to overshare, okay? So it creates that uh, fear of missing out effect where everyone runs and scrolls to see everything, and um, with so much content of it, your attention span simply divides on, on the ever-growing content, and then you don't pay much attention, okay? So if if you want to get elsewhere, if you uh, if you want to, if the platform wants to maximize the content you're exposed to, certainly they don't want to see a red splash screen when you encounter something that says COVID uh, is connected to 5G. Okay, <laughs> and maybe someone will complain and say, "Look, I maybe I know that that's the case, but I want to have a laugh about it." So uh, there is another reason why they don't want to do it. Another thing that that uh, comp uh, that companies do. Is that they provide uh, features on their platforms like mute, block, report, automatic report, automatic block, plugins that help all of these kind of things. So you, you you can simply not be exposed to information that you don't like. Okay, so you can actually fall into a, a, um, something that's called homophilia or echo chambers. It's a little bit overused word, but it means that you're exposed and you contact only with like-minded people. Okay, uh, exposure to uh, information that it's 
contrary to your beliefs becomes a, such a huge trigger. So that spills over um, into uh, as a habituation effect over to um, to the user interface. And then if you're already used and accustomed to using um, and communicating with certain type of structure, like uh, just links or just comments or links and numbers, then seeing something else and then with that being formatted in a different way could immediately create a repelling effect. Okay, so that's another reason why this wanna be avoided. Fourth reason here is that, um, that th th there's a problem, okay? When someone says something on social media, there is a phenomenon called collapse of context. It's okay, so we have, all of us are um, audiences, right? We are a pluralistic audiences, and we see a comment, say, from someone who is responsible for COVID, from Fauci, okay, right? And we are, few of us, are experts in um, in virology or uh, experts in vaccination or have have the data to to analyze even though we are all scientists in those regards uh, and uh, nonetheless we wouldn't want to judge right social media creates that kind of um, hamster uh, wheel where we want to we're constantly in a judgment of something okay judge like dislike like dislike actually creates that kind of um, kind of uh, polarization uh, where context collapse, okay? So I judge something I like, I dislike, I comment. Yesterday, for example, I saw a, a comment from, randomly. I, I we, we have like random um, data collectors that run in our lab. And I often from time to time preparing the presentation, I wanted to add something interesting and I stumble upon a comment uh, that says, yes, I'm a Republican. And there was a photo of IRA, uh, Irish Republican Army uh, with people in balaclavas and, um, and uh, um, and machine guns. So I kind of clicked into the um, into the comments and to see the person. And then the debate came out to be between Republicans and Democrats in the United States. And I was kind of amazed, like, okay, this is really collapse of context. Like, they took image that is out of context and created something that completely got out of uh, out of out of out of hand. So social media, like, if you have such kind of thing, it drives engagement, all right? But we don't want to interrupt that engagement because, of course. It brings us um, bring us money. So there is that tension that it's created. Okay, so that's why um, platforms usually go and do this. Okay, so if you see, for example, in the in the first one, okay, uh, so they covered this Trump thing. Okay, they certainly picked um, contrast that is gray compared to what what usually the tweet come from. Okay. So people can actually read it, okay? The contracts provides attention, drags people's attention. So these covers, that's how they're called, interstitial covers, um, give these descriptions, okay? With links and with option for you to, to view it. But they still blend to a certain extent, like learn more and links into the color scheme and aesthetic of the interface. These tags blend even more. So they, there is little difference between the links, between the, uh, appearance of the link into this post and the warning, okay? So what often happens in our previous research, we found out people don't even see those things. People don't even see the tags at all. They think that they are something about adver advertisements or recommendations. And I picked this second example here precisely because one could think that this is another link or an extension of the link. So it it is created in mind with an incentive to pass a compliance test, but not necessarily interrupt too much, okay? <laughs> so with that in mind, obviously, these things don't work. This covers might work, of course, because you need to read or to move on. It worked to a larger extent. It, it, this is not a uh, algorithmic or prescriptive or programmatic, but in a larger extent, these covers work and this one doesn't. For the reason being that I explained um, explained so far, so uh, and they work because like they, the covers are usually developed historically developed to cover sensitive content, okay, to limit exposure before you get there. As you see the, that example that I show you with the with the splash screen about phishing, that gives that gives you a warning before you see content, okay. This is C four, okay, requires action and it was designed for sensitive violence, PG-13, things like that. But when COVID hit, 
all hands on deck. So they started applying this, this warnings, these covers even on tweets that uh, Twitter subjective, subjectively uh, deemed that they are, that could create problems if people uh, started, uh, started reading them. So covers worked, but um, worked to the extent that for those who want to read it, they read them. For those who read them and disliked them, they moved out. They moved to Parler, they moved to Gab, or they only remained on Parler, they only remained on Gab, and they only remained on, um, and now on, uh, they are on, um, on, on Parler, uh, Gab, Getter, um, 4chan, and all of that. So massive migration started in January uh, 6, 7, 8 uh, from, from last, last year. So this, in the, in the mind of social media platforms said, okay, we have to do this, but this could have a boomerang effect to us, okay? We can't do this too much. We also have to make sure that we use also the tags, okay? So as, as I explained, they are below the content, so you can mistakenly think that they're linked for something, all right? Um, they are always used when you don't want to look partial, okay? When you don't, when you don't want to look judgmental. Um, and but that doesn't work necessarily, okay. And it's not that the, the users only ignore them, okay. Uh, but there are three effects that are observed. What happens with these tags? In one of our research, we observed that, that when content is applied, is tagged with like those tags, the one that I showed, get the COVID, get the facts about COVID nineteen, they create backfire effects. The backfire effect means that users start deleting the content that it's tagged more instead of less. So, okay, so what created, they go and say like, aha, okay, COVID originated from US. Since Twitter said that this is not true, we definitely think that it's true. Another thing that created is that when you apply this too much, everything is a COVID non-fact, everything is COVID non-think, everything is has to be checked with COVID, then it, it's, it's irrelevant. People skip it, okay? Again, fits into that backfiring. And that happens when you start, when platforms started tagging content that linked um, the virus with China, okay? So that was deemed as misinformation, all right? But then uh, President Biden said, we're gonna do um, investigation, whether this is linked to China. And then platform said, okay, from now on, since Biden said this today, we're gonna stop and not do these kind of things, okay? So <laughs> this illusory truth and, and shape-shifting of truth, it's hard to chase with these tags. And they, they, that's why they backfire, that's why they, people don't heed them, all right? And create, like, desensitize them to it. And, but on the other side, platforms cannot afford not to apply them because if absence of tags, if, they, if you immediately stop Applying tags, for the example that I said, COVID versus China, after the investigation was initiated, that that means that if the platform stopped doing that, that they apply that that's truthful, okay? So that means that they have uh, refuted themselves in the past. So all of these problems exist. The motivations and incentives to use these things and not covers I explained before. And on the third thing is that there is so much knowledge of usable security that it's not been used into handling. So our motivation among these three things was to see what we can use from what we know from usable security from before and we have done to, kind, to come and find a common ground where we can do tags or use something else to be able to avoid these effects to a certain extent and actually make this um, this make warnings work for as much as possible people on this uh, on this platform because warnings all the st the studies and we found in our studies too that they polarize okay work the backfire effect works and believe echoes too which again is the same thing make, like making people believe one thing more instead of less works on uh, political lines, okay? Democrats like it, the Republicans don't like it because they identify it with oppression, oppression of free speech, Twitter is not a doctor, stuff like that. Uh, and also uh, translates into skepticism about immunization. 
I want a vaccine. I don't want a vaccine. Okay. If even if I got into into this uh, political uh, metrics, I will define between someone who is pro or against or skeptic and something like that. It requires for you to look into them, okay, um, and understand what they want to say. Get the facts. Get the facts where, okay. I have to click, but how do I know that actually those are the only facts, right? Should the link go to Twitter curated page or should the link go to Wikipedia page? Or the link should go to CDC page or to a WHO page, right? So it, it confu the formatting is confusing and mainly the problem comes from the fact that what you read is generates stronger and automatic effective response, right? The tags being the same color and aesthetic as Twitter could not match that. They could not create a friction for you to stop and say, aha, hold on, how come US created uh, COVID or China created COVID? Or, um, yeah, COVID uh, was caused by 5, uh, 5G. So all of these problems actually motivated um, us, and I have, I have summary of these things, to focus our attention of, of a few things. First, even if we keep the after the fact warning, after people are exposed to that strong affective emotion, we have to create something that um, will grab the attention of the users. And we also have to avoid um, confusing iconography that is there to be avoided, okay? And the last thing that, that, that also has to be addressed is what, what clearly stands out is that lack of context. What should I do? Should I get facts? Should I learn this? I, I don't know what Twitter is telling me here. Is this true or this is not true? Okay. So with that in mind, right? Um, what we decided to do, we decided to update and test uh, warnings with uh, Twitter users. So we do usability A and B evaluation, right? A being Twitter tags, B being our tags, and to see how people are receptive to this. Uh, changes that we that we propose, and the changes again, we agree that we're going to keep the the warnings, right? We'll introduce some kind of friction, and we will see in a moment what uh, what we use as frictions. We'll introduce a little bit of um, and test actually iconography that again goes back to that um, red warning kind of things. And last thing that we wanted to do is um, to provide context. Okay, why a content that this tag is applied to is problematic. Uh, we did a usability study. As I said, I will show you what we used. Uh, we used a couple of uh, instances, a couple of updates. Uh, with the original warning text, we, uh, was, we were able to um, sample 337 Twitter users. Um, not just that the money ran out, but also um, People who met the criteria to be a regular Twitter user or uh, uses Twitter and um, just exhausted what we had on uh, Mechanical Turk. We did open 20 minutes open ended questions with multiple choices, anonymous, of course. We don't want anyone else to think that we collect uh, information that can come back to them. And these are also things that our IRB would not allow us to do it. We randomized exposure, uh, we did a attention and consistency check to prevent from people just clicking randomly things. Uh, we control for uh, external factors, so we created these warnings to apply to content that it's um, not verbatim taken, but can resonate with alleged misinformation on social media that we've encountered uh, or has been deemed as social media by, uh, by other fact checkers that there's a consensus about it. We moved any um, images or names or any, any engagement numbers uh, and stuff like that to be to avoid people thinking, aha, if New York Times says, uh, says this, um, says COVID causes uh, increase in breasts, then uh, that might be, might be true, okay? So we, we wanted to avoid that, and all of these checks have been included. We use three coders to, to code the answers. Here's your uh, intercoder reliability calculated. We did sentiment analysis because we asked people not just to give their preference, which, which warning they want, but why, they prefer their preferences. And we also ask uh, people to, see to whether that warning worked for the particular content that we attach to as, um, as an example. And we did a bit of analysis to see how uh, political leanings, gender, age, race, ethnicity, all of those demographic identifiers 
fit into um, into how people cre uh, come to their to their preferences. So we divided after years of studying Twitter content and working in misinformation. There are a couple of things that happen, all right. And we were lucky that Twitter took action uh, for something that we've observed before. The first thing, the basic thing, is fabricating facts, right? I gave that small expose about uh, truthful, uh, faithfulness to known facts and all that. When you fabricate facts, that's pretty much fake news, rumors, false stuff like that. Okay, something that cannot be verified. And there is another thing where you use facts, but you try to create an improbable interpretation of that. And an example of that is the latest ban of Twitter on uh, Representative Major Green Taylor, that she misinterprets things to advance a cause. So when you spread this information on, on social media in general and Twitter in particular, um, you can do either with you fabricate facts or create something that it's um, unfaithful to, to, fa uh, to known facts or selectively use facts or manipulate them or take them out of context and again, create an impression and narrative that is far from what's the most uh, uh, agreed upon interpretation. So we created tag, we use this kind of um, distinction to create two different types of tags. Tags that work on fabricated facts and tags that work on improbable interpretations of, uh, of facts. So for the first ones, for the fabricated facts, what we did for attention grabbing, we came up with um, acronym. And our acronym was strange, potentially adverse misinformation or spam. Why we did that? Because we wanted the people to be anchored or to use a base rate uh, of an experience of using spam. Okay, if you say something that it's spam, you can look into it, but you should probably avoid it or use it as probably as an amusement. Okay, um, we open our spam for, uh, mails to see if something ended up there, right? But we not necessarily we go uh, during the day and then constantly open spam email to see. Uh, how it's relevant for us. So we wanted to use that experience people have with spam emails, even before um, social media came, to be able to kind of identify that this content might end up in uh, in spam. So that's why we added this uh, context. Okay, if if this tweet was an email, it would definitely end up in your spam folder. Okay, you can see it, but with the our uh, spam filter, we have put it into into. Um, into that folder. We also paired, we, we did a couple of variants, one with only the tag and one the tag with a 50% transparency of a red flag watermark. So we used red flag watermarks instead of putting a red flag uh, a small tag or emoji into the, um, into the warning because we wanted to avoid the use of, of red flag emojis already in the text. So that would have created the same confusion I showed you with the tags and then uh, the, the link on, on top of it. Instead, people are also, again, even before social media, people are used to using watermarks as gestalt to something that uh, needs attention, all right? And also transparency in order to, for you to be able to read it, but for you to give a little bit of effort for you to read it, okay? So if you don't wanna give, give, uh, give, an, uh, give an effort, to read what's going on, the flag will create, will repel you to do it, okay? So that was the desired effect that we wanna achieve and see which one will work uh, the best. The idea with the flag, it comes from that platform that I mentioned that we developed, VoxPop, uh, where we, um, the fact checking uh, agreement and uh, score that was assigned and changed all the time was used as an input how transparent should a red flag watermark will be on a, on a post. So if there is consensus on the platform that a post is uh, um, wrong, together with fact checks, the transparency uh, drops, okay, and, and vice versa. But we settled down on 50% to be sufficiently enough um, to repel um, anyone who doesn't want to give it a try. So there, here, is, here is an example. I zoomed this out so you can read it, but we used, uh, as I said, a generic uh, icon name, generic username, so people don't look into those things. You, our participants go into those things 
uh, but just read the stuff here. And we again included that URL just to see how this will pan out even bigger than what we had, what we had here. What, here is how they look. And we compare these two with the original tag that said, get the facts about, about COVID-19. Uh, COVID uh, and this is the flag, how we used it. And we used a flag that it's inclined, a little bit is inclined, uh, and it's all red, just to avoid uh, identification or confusion with the red flag used as, as emojis uh, again. So our rationale, as I said, we wanted to use availability and recognition. We wanted to see that people can recognize this and they already have available experience of this, uh, of, of, uh, of, the, of the red flag and of the spam, okay? Uh, we also wanted to avoid uh, the procession trap of correcting feelings, okay? Not falsehood. So all the problems when, when people, when you ask people why uh, they don't prefer uh, warning tags or warning covers or any kind of content moderation um, elements, they will tell you, oh, you, you're, 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 you're not collecting thoughts, but you're collecting, you're, you're collecting our feelings and we're entitled to feel as we want. So we wanted to avoid that, uh, avoid that too, because we've encountered that in our previous, previous uh, uh, studies. So let me go here. Uh, the second one that we did is we played a little bit with something that is informal and language that could be misinterpreted here, okay? So we, uh, when we did interpretation, we asked people to consider a tweet even only for, for, the, for the sake of the facts, okay? So we coined something to read for fact's sake, right? I presume if you are alert still to the presentation, you have thoughts about how this could be interpreted. And that was our idea, right? FFS could mean something else. That's what that's we wanted to see because Twitter is conductive to using uh, acronyms, right? LOL, be right back, all of this. We wanted to see how this will capture attention, even though it will cause a small, uh, small confusion. Because once they read this, the context is clear. It gives uh, choices why someone should discard this tweet as misinformation, even though it was a little bit confused or shaken up a little bit uh, with a hook. We use this as a hook for them to read it. So uh, either they can avoid it because it's, you know, it's incomplete factual representation. It doesn't have contextual consistency. It, 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 it shows overt factual manipulation or it obscures where the facts come from. So your pick, why would you like to discard this? You don't have to get this. We brought it to you, okay? You don't have to go and learn more. Here are the most, the four most uh, potent uh, causes for you to discard it. So pick one and move on. That was our um, rationale here. Oops. So here, how they look, okay? We took one date silver um, post with numbers, something to look like, which uh, to look like uh, an effect that we observed and medical people also observed too, it's called pseudo peer review, okay? So you take data and then you, you do a peer review or review by yourself. And this is how they looked uh, when we applied them into, uh, into this test, into this test, uh, twist, test tweet. We wanted to do anchoring, as I said, that anchoring to be the hook, okay? When people read it, they're like, oh, what's, hmm. This is not what I expected, but, the cost for you continue reading it. We did a pilot study. People continue reading it. No one stopped not reading it. Once you read that halfway, it's certainly uh, useful for it for you to read the context till till the um, till the end. So once we had that, for the first one we called them spam, and for the second one we called FFS. And these are the results. Okay, so. Uh, these are the options. So this is the original one. This is the one that we proposed. Uh, some percentages, breakdowns, and on justifications why people prefer one over over another. So, 12% of our data set said they don't like either. Okay, so they don't like either. Tweet, the, the wording there was uh, <laughs> very uh, very clear why they don't like it, um, and. Uh, for the original one, uh, half 
when we did the spam comparisons, more than half said that it's not about what you see into into the tag. It's again that uh, that party line of a Twitter intrusion. Okay, uh, as you see, someone's like we we took representative quotes when we said when we asked them why would you prefer A because the thought that the one that we gave them as an option is intrusive and opinion shaped, which is fine. We knew that we we're going to run into that kind of uh, um, problem because uh, the audience that comes to Twitter is so varied that we cannot, one size would not fit all. Okay, so if one size doesn't fit all, then we might as well test it. Okay, haters going to hate, lovers going to love, all, all that, that that's that's incorporated, but we did this over four or five months. We just wanted to see, make sure that we actually ask the as representative as possible sample for these things. And we expect that it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. And sure enough, uh, we would like the first one because it's not opinion concerning. Half, uh, almost 20% of the people said it's too uh, confusing, all right? Uh, too wordy, they don't want to read it through. We broke the one liner, right? Twitter has. Uh, rule for one liner uh, comments, meaning that the comment or the, the, the warning tag has to fit into a one line under the tweet. We did that. We were aware of the trade offs that we're going to have that, that, that might happen. And we wanted to see whether that is a problem or not. So we can develop new ones and, or, or another versions of this for later, later on. For the ones that, for the ones that preferred the spam tags that I showed you, uh, 43% immediately said that they liked the context that we provided to them, okay? So if you see the, the quotes, people say like, okay, if you tell me this is spam, it's really more useful than telling me that I have to find facts, okay? That's, that's something that we envisioned helping and that actually did help in a large extent, uh, most dominantly what we wanted to achieve and we're really happy, happy about it. The second uh, most quoted or cited reason why this uh why they preferred our option of of tagging misinformation was that uh one person people went in length explaining and uh, uh people liked to uh see right away that something is misinformation okay so this clearly shows preferences that we might guess but here is hard evidence that uh, people like because of those things and um even the tags, even only the tags without the flag, still 10% of the people said uh, that they attach the attention. So that spam um, friction worked for uh, for non negligible part of our um, uh, people. And some of them said that they don't want to click any links while they scroll, which fits into that flow consumption that I explained, that I mentioned in the introduction. For the text and flags, a similar outcome is again, we expected that they will uh, dislike <laughs> the flag. It seems too intrusive, too big, all of that, but again, revolves around something that it's against the soft moderation and tagging in general, and I'm necessarily pro the original tags that Twitter has. So in both cases, and you'll see later on the same thing, whoever uh, not preferred the the recommendations that we get for our enhanced warning tags, they did it because they hated what we proposed, not that because loved the other one. <laughs> and they were not enough, uh, they were not necessarily bold enough to say that they, they, don't, they don't like. It. Clearly and expectedly, again, 41.9% said that the flag is attention grabbing, okay? And that, together with the meaningful contents and justification, exactly fit the bill most of the people of, of our, um, the majority of our people in our sample to like these kind of things with explanations. I mean, I, I put this big one because there are numerous places were saying like, oh, I walk my dog and I don't see, and if I see the flag, I'll stop and then do it and not forget it. Or I'm taking the trash or looking into the phone, or I'm um, waiting for the commercials on Hulu to go and then I just want to scroll as much as possible and I will avoid it and forget about it. So it did precisely what we knew and implemented from usable security and design to uh, help people 
engage at least with the content, not accepted, not rejected, but at least not uh, not avoided or in incorporated um, uh, and integrated into their um, opinion. With its uh, sentiment, it is sentiment analysis, and uh, obviously the sentiment for the um, for the flags. We have breakdowns here. The for for our it's our we call it option option B. Uh, we do have a little bit more positive sentiment than in both cases than the the negative sentiment and the negative sentiment comes mostly when they talk against lack of actual determined dealing with uh, with misinformation on um, on Twitter and he, uh, see in the in, when for the other ones what I said before it was mostly against against what we what we do pretty much disliking um, what we offer if not here then definitely here disliking the flag as uh, as a biggest biggest uh, destructor we did correspondence analysis to um, again put a little bit of which word and how that is explained of course we want our own opinion we don't want twitter uh twitter is not going to tell us what is true and the ones who wanted what we did wanted something clear and that it's more in terms in terms of um of context when we ask them okay one thing it's preference but the other thing is what would actually when you see the information about tweet please read the tweet now and see the see the tag uh, and tell us if this helped um if this do you believe this is true or not okay and if this helped you uh discard this as misinformation now even the, the, from even if we expect it to be some around something around half right 46 7 8 uh in fact we as you can see there are people actually from who preferred or who uh, the other uh, the original option and didn't prefer anything to actually see that that link that misinformation is misinformation okay so to a certain extent we some kind of pegging some kind of possible option that we could fight back the backfiring effect that's 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 what we wanted to show here that actually it did and they provide explanation they did provide explanations we didn't have room into the paper to to do uh sentiment analysis of that but they did provide the explanation like even though i think the red flag is obnoxious i do think that the tag will or the flag like they both help me um dispelling uh, dispelling the mis uh, the misinformation we found statistical significant um uh, correlation with the political leanings um and uh, obviously it uh, it does fall into the trends that I explained before but importantly there are significant part of moderate and uh right leaning participants that uh, prefer uh the spam okay so we we didn't expect that what what would say like okay you have predominantly left on moderate and you don't have anyone from the right leanings but here if you see right leanings are Equally distributed between the first one, the second one, and the new one. Yes, if you if we combine the, the original and the neither, neither, we get into a bigger number, but still comparable. Something that it's not necessarily a full trend. So we do have people who um, who fit into those stereotypical. We like this, we don't like this, but we have roughly a third. What we calculated actually did like the context and um, the frictions that we provided, and also what we found education level is expectedly correlated our postgraduates preferred our option the most interestingly some of those get college three against one compared to ones who prefer the first one and we are somewhere around let's say losing a little bit compared to the original ones to the ones who had college and we are equal here with the with the with the high schools so it it does have um it does help people who have either too much confidence or not necessarily entire confidence to do this kind of thing and it fits it, it logically could be explained into into that way so for the for the FFS ones we again have like the verbosity and confusion they didn't want too much words okay i don't want twitter to do anything and it was interesting that FFS was much even was even more effective to what we actually did in the previous one so 
almost 70% love the contact. Almost 70% love that they can actually pick why they don't want pick and feel okay with it, why they want to discard this kind of interpretation, improbable interpretation of um, of uh, of facts. And same thing, same same distribution happened when we had uh, the um, uh, the flag. People like the attention grabbing together with the context that was that was uh, provided. Similar, we had much more positive uh, sentiment when we talked about uh, why people preferred what we did with uh, with the FFS tag. Negative sentiment. It did. It happened to swell with the flag. We expected that to happen here compared to the one without it. Um, and similar distributions of why they want to do it here. We did a correspondence analysis instead of adjectives of verbs because they're um, they were interchangeable uh, when we uh, when we compare. And then of course the preferences is uh, something that we want to that they want to see. Uh, and it tells that actually something is this is, is information. Same trends we observe for oops, apologies. Here, even more, the dispelment was almost 70% of participants said yes. We really, this helped us read through the tweet and see that that logic is faulty and that interpretation of the fact is something that we don't subscribe uh, to. Similar distribution on uh, on the political leanings, of course, and similar distribution on education level. So what we saw in the two, we the randomization help us avoid ten person being exposed to both of them. So that's why we separated them, um, and uh, this is also another proof that we have uh, that what we found could be useful into creating something that can be tailored per user. Okay, so one size doesn't fit all, but what we could do. Uh, for future is uh, make sure that the appeal actually is based on the diet, right? Through their nose, and you all know how to infer what kind of diet and what kind of um, you know, feed one has, and based on the feed to create the particular tags that they wanna uh, they they wanna they wanna see. Okay, and uh, based on that, we came up and we're right now doing 2.0 evaluations where we kept for the first one the spam with just a one liner like in the both cases to avoid verbosity so we want to see how these two will drop or how will fare in, in in the comparisons and then of course we wanted to we will remove that ffs or we'll keep it but we want to see how when we have the word facts that will actually fit it and the last thing that we did was uh we are doing right now currently ongoing is that we use this iconography from uh, for your phone when you have the phone and then you see when you spam there is this is the icon that predominantly Gmail but other uh, users use to indicate that something something is spam without even have to have being read so we variate this to be gray as actually default in Gmail or being read to see how the red and the red text will will do and the same thing here to be consistent instead of a explanation mark we used we use the we use the question mark. Uh, so that's pretty much my uh, um, our work fresh off, as I said, of uh, of the process of our lab. So now I open the floor for questions. I hope that I um, you found this interesting and informative. What are your plans for future uh, work continuing this theme? So we, we did those. We are now in a data collection process. We, our idea is to see if we can partner with Twitter to do this kind of test. So we would like to, we are still talking to our universities, um, departments, what's the best way for us to approach and how to, to talk to them if they want to like to do this um, and we definitely want to have this in the next couple of months or less to approach twitter and or facebook perhaps um, and see if they want to do some kind of trials with us um, uh, in terms of informing what we found and if they want to assimilate our results here
I, I don't see faces, so I don't know if anyone is asking a question. Uh, hi, I do have a question for you. You were talking hi, earlier. Hi, uh, you were talking earlier about how there is different modes that people use when they're going through Twitter. Some people will go through Twitter but will never click on any of the links, no matter what. Some people might be walking their dog while they're going through Twitter, etc. Did you find a pattern between how people were using Twitter if they were, you know, distracted while doing it, if they were focused specifically on the platform, uh, and the chance they would then go and click on one of the boxes that had some clear flag and then sort of breeze through it and read the article anyway? No, we, we didn't control for how they were accessing this, whether it was on a phone, whether it was on a, on a computer. It, um, we didn't know like how uh, they did it, uh, nor we embedded this into other content. So that's something that we would like to do into that trial to embed these kind of things within other content, okay? For these things to pop up into into a regular feed and to see how this, we, we couldn't like, we would do that. We have some experimental Twitter clients, but uh, it, we were reluctant to use it because people will feel that this is a test and not the actual actual tweet and that might affect how they will this how they will determine so we have to make the client look as original as is and for us to make look original as is we have to know what kind of feed each user needs and if we got we if we go with the generic one then again we run into the same same problem as as, as we have now so we, we we didn't but we definitely like to actually try and get at least in categories so we can use into that test Twitter client that we have. Gotcha. And has any research been done into time barriers? What if you click on the window to reveal the problematic tweet and then there's a two second delay? Has that been researched at all? Um, it has. It has. Delays are introduced uh, for um, it's delay started introducing obviously for uh, for infrastructural and scalability reasons, but in usable security they introduced together with random um, logouts or random errors to make sure right in captcha captcha style of uh, of authentication. But uh, it has been done not necessarily on Twitter, okay, but it has been delayed um, in terms of attention span. So it, um, it is dependent largely on uh, what task is at hand. If the task is entertainment, the delay is insumerable. If you want to do something that it, you, you will wait. So it, it, it follows the natural uh, tendency of someone who needs to do something online and not necessarily doing something for, for fun. I see. Thank you. You're not welcome. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you very much. We we appreciate your interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to extend this work and hopefully to present it further further on. We'll be back in uh, two weeks, um, at which time the guest speaker will be um, Corona Yoshi. So uh, this concludes our session. Bye. All right. Thank you, everybody.